This is the 1808 Bex Mill in Indiana. I'm Darren, and this is the Industrial Revolution. See, outside the entrance to a cave, uh, Bex Mill has a long history. Let's take a look. In 1807, George Beck came here with his wife and seven, yes, seven kids. George served in the Revolutionary War and was here to collect on his free land, which was offered to all veterans of the war. He found the spring here and built the first mill, which was a small 15 by 15 foot building with just one set of millstones, which he'd quarried himself. He built a dam and used hollowed out logs to channel water to a small wheel. The first corn was ground here on August 28, 1808. The mill, as they tended to do, attracted settlers to the area, which tended to create problems with the previous residents. So George ended up building a fort right next door to help protect the new settlers. As more people moved into the area, lines got too long, and a new larger mill was built in 1825. That mill lasted until, as often happened with grist and carding mills, the 1825 mill burned down. It was rebuilt in 1864. But during the rebuilding, the mill was almost burned down again, this time by Morgan's Raiders, a group of Confederate soldiers marching through the area, demanding a $1,000 ransom to be paid to them in order to not burn down a business. Well, the community was helping to rebuild the mill when they showed up, and all the wives had made plenty of food for the workers to keep them fed and keep them happy while they were working. So instead of paying the ransom, they just fed Morgan's Raiders and apparently fed them really well. And there's also a bit of a rumor that it may not have been only food, but there could have been a good amount of moonshine involved here as well. In any case, Morgan's Raiders moved on and the 1864 mill we see here today continued to be rebuilt. Let's head inside. This mill here is from 1864 and it was made in Louisville. The way this works is farmers would send their kids ahead to maintain their spot in line for getting milling done. Mm -hmm. Now the miller got one eighth of whatever he milled, is that's how he got paid. So they would bring in the wheat or barley from the field, put it into this hopper, this set of bucket conveyors, which are leather with metal cups, would take it upstairs to a machine called the smutter. What the smutter would do would separate all the field chaff from the kernels of wheat. The chaff would be shot out the side of the building. The wheat would then come down this hopper, go into this mill. Now this mill is a 30 inch undershot mill. We call it an undershot mill because the top stone is stationary. The bottom stone is raised and lowered to how fine the grind. And the bottom one rotates. The bottom one rotates. That's unusual. Which is unusual. Now the way this work mill ran is outside under the doghouse there is a water turbine. Water turbine drives the shaft under the floor, drives the belt which drives the mill. This crank back here would raise and lower the stone, mm -hmm. giving you the fineness of the grind. The ground wheat would then exit, go up this bucket conveyor upstairs to a machine called a bolter. Now the bolter is about nine foot long and has different size screens. It's a rotating drum. And as the ground flour would go down through the screens, 
it would give you your different grades of flour. Now this machine over here is from the Stroud Company in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. This also is a 30 inch undershot mill, but this is driven by a 20 foot water wheel outside the wall. Drives the shaft under the floor, drives the leather belt, which drives the mill. Again, this 30 inch stones. The stones in both of these mills are still original. They've had to be regrouped, but they are still the original stones, which is very rare. Hand crank on the other side, adjust the lower stone to the fineness of the grind. Corn goes in the top, the ground corn comes out the side. We then collect it, sift it, and bag it for sale. Mm -hmm. How much water we feed the meal, wheel via hand crank outside the wall gives you the speed of the mill. The more corn you feed it, it slows the mill down mm -hmm. because of fineness of grind. So it's a balancing act between how much water you feed versus how much corn you feed to get your grinding speed. Mm -hmm. You don't want to drive the mill too fast. You don't want to turn it too slow. If you get the stones too close together, you burn the grain. Mm -hmm. Now the way the stones are shaped is they have grooves in them, top and bottom. Depending on how close those stones are is the fineness of grind. As we take a look at the whole milling area with the wheat mill up front here and the corn mill towards the back, remember that the main difference between these two mills is really just the way the millstones are dressed. Corn doesn't need cracking cut into the millstones, but wheat does. Other than that, these two mills basically work the same way and do the same thing. And here we have a newer addition to the mill. That is for sifting cornmeal. Okay. This one is a steel mill that was used later on mm -hmm. and we're not allowed to run it but that has steel spur gears instead of stones. Okay. There's one of the original millstones leaning against the wall. Looks a bit worn. A little bit. And of course the big arm is swung out and that's how they would pick up the stones right. and clean them and then reset them. Mm -hmm. Here is the dam. We had a lot of rain last night, <laughs> so water is pouring out of the sink. Water for the mill is provided from this cave, which, without the dam, is about 10 to 12 feet high and goes back about a mile and a half. The dam was built by George Beck before the current mill and provides good water pressure to the pipe coming out of the dam. The dam, along with the mill, has had a lot of restoration work done. But as you can see, as happens with limestone, uh, there are some leaks around the sides. This is how new cave formation happens. Fairly uncommonly here, instead of using a wooden overhead sluice, the water is ducted through this pipe down to the bottom and then uses a vertical pipe from that larger pipe, which holds pressurized water at this point, pumping water up to the top of the 20-foot-high water wheel. 
Check out my water wheel video for more information on how these work. It's linked in the description. This is actually the original pipe put here in 1864, although to be fair that pipe was leaking pretty badly when restoration work was done here in 2008. They removed the original pipe and sent it out to be lined with the modern pipe and then they reinstalled the new relined pipe. So the pipe we see is actually the original, but the water actually traps, travels through an inner pipe. Let's take a closer look at this pipe. Looking down the pipe from the dam, we see it comes down from the dam to the bottom of the valley, and then we have a vertical pipe that goes up to the main wheel, which we already discussed. That wheel powers all the equipment in the back half of the mill. From there, it continues down the valley to that large, weird, circular feature with water spraying out of it before turning into the mill. Just inside the mill, there's another water turbine. In this case, uh, the water turbine powers all the equipment in the front half of the mill. So this mill was actually operated with both a water wheel and a water turbine. If you'd like more information on water turbines, I have a video on that also. Uh, check out the description. So what about that odd circular feature in the middle of the pipe spraying water out the top? Well, that's actually another turbine. That was directly underneath the sawmill, which was at one point built on a platform out here above it. You can see the shed for the sawmill in this historic photo, along with some lumber piled up beside the mill on the left. So why was there a sawmill here too? Let's head back into the mill and upstairs while we discuss it. Grist mills were mostly used in late summer and into the fall to grind grain, and, well, then they sat idle for most of the rest of the year. Adding a sawmill allowed for use the rest of the year. Here at Beck's Mill, they actually wanted a bit more than just a sawmill, though. So in 1825, and later in the 1864 version of the mill, they added a carting mill upstairs as well. In the back, we have a picker, which cleans the wool and removes uh, grass and leaves and what is euphemistically referred to as organic material from the wool before it's fed into these two larger machines up front, which are carding machines. On the left, this machine produced wool bats. Uh, bats are, are the large flat mats that you see here, and they're great for providing padding and insulation if you're making a quilt, for example. The machine on the right produces roving. It looks kind of like ropes, and this is actually ideal for feeding into a spinning wheel or a spinning mill, and this is actually the ideal form for producing either yarn or thread. With wool harvested in the spring, grain in late summer and fall, and wood year-round, that would allow the mill to continue operations until 1914, when the faster, more efficient roller mills really started to take over and ran these small grist mill operations out of business. Beck's mill maintained limited operations until around 1950, when the mill was finally abandoned for the next half century before restoration work began. Although it's the third generation of this mill, hopefully it's the last one. Hopefully this one sticks around and continues to be part of the Industrial Revolution. Hey, wait, before you go, uh, I need your help to keep going here. Uh, so as you can see, I'm, I'm out here today in, in Smoky Mountains, uh, filming on location. Uh, almost every video I do is on location, and unfortunately that's not cheap. Uh, so if you could help me out, uh, I'd really appreciate it. There's, there's some easy ways to do that. First way to help me out is completely free. Uh, just hit like and subscribe and share this video with your friends. Draw more people to the channel. That, that's great. That helps a lot. Also, you can comment. I love reading the comments. And I've had some great ideas from those comments, in fact. Uh, finally, if you can, uh, if you can help out on Patreon, uh, at patreon.com slash industrial revolution or hit super thanks or uh, something I just added uh, just before recording this. I have a affiliate store set up uh, on the link to the video on the channel or on the closing screen here. Hit the shop button. That'll take you out to my webpage. Uh, follow any of those links out to Amazon or other sites. 
and the channel will get a percentage of your entire purchase, even if you don't purchase that thing you look at. So lots of cool stuff over there. All of those really help the channel out a lot. Thanks for coming again and watching the video, and I look forward to seeing you again next week.